Welcome back and alive now from Fox. I'm Austin Westfall. Well, a lot of eyes have been on President Biden and he gave a pivotal speech today at the NATO summit. We've been watching him as he's been uh, traversing world leaders. Uh, we saw him give his first extended solo press conference, if you will. He did speak about NATO to a large degree, but he also did some back and forth with reporters. It's the first time we've seen him do this at length since his debate performance two weeks ago. We want to break this down with presidential historian and attorney James Robinald. James, it's good to see you as always. Uh, surface level, right off the bat, what are your initial reactions to Biden's performance today? Yeah, good to, good to see you, Austin. I, I was very interested in how he would do in a press conference because he really has avoided them over the last year in particular. And he stumbled. Uh, he had a hard time finishing his sentences. Uh, he would get halfway through it and he'd say, well, anyway. Um, and, you know, it just, he seems like someone who is, has something more going on than his lifelong problem of stuttering, um, which goes back to his childhood. Um, but he really seems to be struggling to remember things, to finish sentences. He confuses names. Uh, he did, a really bad thing was that the whole thing started with him calling uh, Kamala Harris Vice President Trump. Um, and, you know, little things are okay. You know, you're going to do stuff like that. But he really seemed like he was struggling to get through with things and that he um, was like a, 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 you know, a boxer who had taken too many punches. All right. So what I want to do is take the opportunity to play out some of what we watched today. Some of these clips are a little more lengthy, but I want to watch them with you and then have some reaction on the back end of it. Let's play this first one out where he talks about schedule limitations. That's something that we've been seeing reports about is the fact that Biden wants to start his days a bit later and end them a bit earlier. He addressed that directly at today's uh, speech. Let's watch this. <clears throat> Presidency is the most straining job in the world and it's 24 seven. How can you say you'll be up for that next year, in two years, in four years, given the limits you've acknowledged that you have today? The limits I've acknowledged I have? There's been reporting that you've acknowledged that you need to go to bed earlier and your evening around eight. That's not true. Look, <laughs> what I said was, instead of my every day starting at seven and going to bed at midnight, it'd be smarter for me to pace myself a little more. And I said, for example, the eight, seven, six stuff, instead of starting a fundraiser at nine o'clock, start at eight o'clock. People get to go home by 10 o'clock. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about, and if you look at my schedule since, I've, since I made that stupid mistake of, in the campaign, in the, in the debate, I mean, my schedule has been full bore. I've done, where's, when, where's Trump been? Riding around in his golf cart, filling out his scorecard before he hits the ball? I mean, look, uh, he's done virtually nothing. And I have, I don't know how many, don't hold me to it, roughly 20 major events. Someone with thousands of people showing up. And so I just think it's better. I always have an, an inclination, whether I was playing sports or doing politics, just to keep going, not stop. I just gotta just pace myself a little more. Okay, so that's something that has been reported widely, the fact that he, he may want to wind his days down by 8 p.m. perhaps. Uh, James, you know this perhaps better than anybody. How rigorous is the job of the presidency? And if you can, please put it in the context of uh, what we're watching uh, given Biden's performance as of late. Yeah, well, I think the last time I talked to you, I said the presidency is the most difficult job in the world and it kills people. I and mean, we talked about Woodrow Wilson having a stroke right after him, Warren Harding, who was 58 years old, uh, had heart failure and died. Johnson was, uh, you know, pretty much destroyed by it. And, you know, it's, it's an office that is 24 seven. It has enormous responsibilities. Richard Nixon, for example, made it his habit of going over to the executive office building and taking a nap on a couch that was over in a big, in his office in the executive office building. Um, he did that daily. Uh, he had a doctor visit him who may have been giving him some amphetamines or vitamins in a shot to keep him going. Um, and the same with JFK. He, there were times when he was taking amphetamine type shots to keep up with it. So it's, 
even on much younger men, um, it's a rigorous job that can tear you apart. And I think you see every president age considerably, and I think Biden has aged considerably. And, I, and so I think it would be smart for him to adjust his schedule, but it's not altogether practical when presidents routinely, um, you think about Reagan or Obama, come home with their homework and work t till very late getting through their papers. Um, so it's it's difficult for someone to be saying, I wanna run for office, but I can't be really as fully invested as, as I need to be. I need to pace myself. It's a difficult message to sell, I think. I don't know about you, but after I watched the latest Biden-Trump debate, I went back and I watched some of the 2020 debates just to see, you know, I wanted to compare the two and see how the performances uh, held up to each other four years apart. Did you notice anything different? Uh, and if you did notice anything different, what exactly have you noticed that's different about how Biden handles things like debates and speeches four years ago versus what we're seeing today? Yeah, I mean, Biden um, is much stiffer uh, four years later. He was much more fluid, even with his stuttering problem. He knew how to fight when he wanted to fight. He knew how to emphasize things. He could be very homey in his descriptions. He wasn't as halting in his, uh, you know, attempt to complete a sentence or complete a thought or, or put m multiple thoughts together. Um, so, I mean, I think th th there's a big difference. I think if you put him side by side, you'll see how he has aged. And uh, there's something going on with him that's causing this stiffness. And all these questions about a neurological exam and so forth, which he was asked about tonight, still very much linger. And it's what I talked about with you the last time that um, until he has a full neurological exam, not just one of these tests of, you know, can you remember these five words, but somebody really looking at his brain and saying it looks like he's okay or it looks like he's truly aged. Um, I think these these issues are just going to linger and um, he's not getting out of it. It is, it is continuing and uh, it feels in some ways like the dam at some point is going to break. I want to play one more clip out. Let's watch this. We've had some discussions over the past few days with your press secretary about the question of health exams. And you said you take a cognitive test every day in this job. Are you open to taking another physical or test before the election? Governor Whitmer of Michigan, for instance, said it wouldn't hurt to take a test. Well, look, two things. One, I've taken three significant and intense neurological exams by, the neuro by a, a neurologist. In each case, as recently as February, and they say I'm in good shape, okay? Although I do have a little problem with my left foot because it's not as sensitive because I broke my foot and didn't wear the boot. But, but, but I'm, I'm good. I'm tested every single day by my neurological capacity, the decisions I make every day. You talk to my staff, all of you talk to my staff. Sometimes my staff talks a lot. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, I don't think you have them telling you that all the major ideas we've undertaken haven't been in part initiated by me. I remember when this- You had some discussions over the past few days with your press secretary about- Yeah, so the clip just looped back there to the beginning of it. But I wanted to ask you about what he kind of touched on there at the end of that clip. He, he speaks about the fact that there's a lot of people around him. And there sure has been a lot of chatter out there regarding does, does Biden necessarily make these decisions himself? I don't think anybody truly knows the answer to that question, James. I, what I want to ask you, though, is what's your feel of how Biden is taking this grand question of whether or not he drops out? Do you get the feeling from Biden that this has to be his decision? Does this have to come from within? Is that what you're hearing? Yeah, I, very much so. He, he really has to be told you can't win. He said that at the end of the press conference. He said, if they tell me that, that's different. But he still thinks he can win. And the problem with the presidency, we had this with Richard Nixon, for example. When you're in that office, it's so powerful that you come to believe in yourself and your ability to handle the job. And you really begin to think that others can't do it, that you alone can do it. And that's just, that's not true. There, there are others who could do it. His vice president could handle this job. Um, but I do believe that his family is very much involved in this decision. But I think it's going to take 
a number of high level Democrats to come to him and say, you can't win. The polls don't allow you to win in this in this case, and you, we can't risk that. If that happens, I think he would listen to them and withdraw. But, um, you know, it's hard to do that with a sitting incumbent because um, they can't do that kind of thing until they know he's really going to, it's kind of a chicken and egg, know he's going to drop out. And if they don't think he's going to drop out, they can't get out in front of cameras and say, I think he should drop out, except for a few. I mean, most people are still trying to hang in there. But, you know, at some point uh, with performances like tonight again, he just is not coming across as capable of handling this job for the next four years. He addressed the question of Democrats that have been calling for him to step out of the race. Let's play that clip. Thank you, Mr. President. You mentioned other instances in history where presidents have faced a challenge. But what makes this moment in history so unique is that it is not your enemies who are calling on you to reconsider your decision to stay in the race. It's your friends, supporters, people who think you've done a great job over the past four years. Have you spent time thinking about what it would mean for your legacy, which you've worked decades to build, if you stay in the race, despite the concerns that voters say they have, and you lose to someone who you yourself have argued is unfit to return to the Oval Office? Well, look, I'm not in this for my legacy. I'm in this to complete the job I started. As you recall, understandably, many of you and many economists thought my initial initi initiatives that I put forward can't do that. It's going to cause inflation. Things are going to skyrocket. The debt's going to go up. What are you hearing now from mainstream economists? 16 economic Nobel laureates said I've done a hell of a job. Okay, so James, I want to also just read a little bit of what we've been seeing from some of House members, senators. We, we've heard from a handful of House members, Democrats. We have heard from at least one Democratic senator so far to call on him to withdraw. Uh, that was Peter Welch of Vermont. We also heard from George Clooney. People might ask, why is Clooney important? Well, just a few weeks ago, he headlined a fundraiser that brought in a record single night haul for the president's reelection campaign. So all that considered, James, uh, you know, can you think back in history uh, of, of any other time where a president's own party has taken actions of this nature? What comes to mind when you think back? Yeah, the last time the Democrats faced this, actually the last time we faced it with the president was Jimmy Carter. And I don't know if you remember this or not, but uh, Teddy Kennedy made a real run uh, against him as an incumbent. And it really divided the Democrats. And of course, Carter then lost uh, to Ronald Reagan in 1980. But it was it caused a lot of division within the party for Teddy Kennedy to come out and run against an incumbent. And it was, it did deal a severe blow to the Democrats and the chances of Carter getting reelected. Um, so, you know, it, it is a, it's a high wire act right now. And, you know, the, the politicians know that. I, I would bet that if we sat in a room with them um, without cameras, they would tell you that they don't really know what to do at this point. I mean, that it's, it is so uncertain, but it is also very risky to stay with somebody who seems uh, that he's gonna lose. And it seems like these problems are not getting better and that the Trump campaign is gonna be able to run some really severe ads um, against Biden. So, I, you know, it's it's hard to go after an incumbent. On the other hand, if you've got an incumbent who's definitely going to lose, um, you really, you know, it's like an emergency situation. You have to kind of break the glass and, and try to do something different that will change the narrative. Looney himself, I believe, was quoted as saying in that op-ed piece that he's spoken privately with so many Democratic leaders who have told him off the record that they do in fact believe Biden should step aside. One more clip I want to play for you, James. Let's watch. Bush candidacy in 2020, you referred to yourself as being a, a bridge candidate for a younger, fresher generation of Democratic leaders. And I wanted to know what changed. What changed was the gravity of the situation I inherited in terms of the economy, our foreign policy, and domestic division. And I think, I, I won't put words in anybody's mouth. 
Most presidential historians give me credit for having accomplished more than most any president since Johnson and maybe before that to get major pieces of legislation passed. And what I realized was my long time in the Senate had equipped me to have the wisdom to know how to deal with the Congress to get things done. We got more major legislation passed that no one thought would happen. And I want to finish it. All right. Your presidential historian is what he says true. Well, f first of all, I don't think that answer met the question. <laughs> I thought the question was, you would be a bridge to younger people. And he began speaking about his record. Um, so I don't, I, I think that I was trying to figure out what he was saying, but what he says about his record is true. It's a remarkable record. Uh, all the more reason, I think, for him, uh, if he's not going to win, and they tell him he's not going to win, to uh, step aside and let someone else run on this record, because it's a great record. The economy is showing great signs. Even today, we had better signs. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that he is to be given credit as someone who had been in the Senate and knew how to get legislation done. Bipartisan legislation after the Trump presidency was extraordinary. Um, so I think that he he deserves a ton of credit for what he's done. The problem is, um, you know, people aren't going to elect him just on his record. They want to know what he's going to be doing in the future and what he's going to be capable of doing in the future. All right. We'll leave it at that. James, as always, we appreciate your insight. Take care. Thanks, Austin.